Good evening, welcome to A1 TV, the Mark Show, episode 11. And the person on your screen right there, it may be for me to some people, I think it was involved in some mine accident many years ago. But it's football where I want to start off because I'm a footy nut. In 2001, I lived in Hobart. I used to follow the scores all around Australia. And there was a bloke playing up in the northern part of Tasmania called Todd Russell. Todd was kicking goals, multiple goals. And I thought, we've got to go and see this guy because we were doing a bit of a tour around Tasmania, looking at different football competitions. Todd Russell, welcome to the program. Footy started way back when. Thanks, Tony. Thanks for having us aboard, mate. Uh, look forward to having a bit of a chat. My footy career started as a young kid back in uh, the small country town of Beaconsfield. You know, as a kid coming through playing mini league throughout all my junior footy and and not only with the mini leagues through under 17s and whatnot. Most of my footy was played in the back line. I was a, a centre half back, and then you know in the later years when probably a well-known Tassie footballer Mick Elmer come to the Tamer Cats and coached us down there when I started playing down there, and I went forward from there. And how many clubs across the north northern part of Tasmania did you play at? Because I remember. I think it was in 2001, you might have been at Hillwood or Campbelltown, but you had a bit of a stint in a couple of clubs up that way. Yeah, look, I started off uh, as a um, 14 or 15 year old kid playing with Beauty Point. And I played my first senior game with Beauty Point under Francis Woolley as a coach, which I remember uh, we played Northern Districts at the NTCA ground. And uh, I had a bit of an altercation with an older fellow by the name of Graham Gardner. But then obviously the Beauty Point and Beaconsfield amalgamated and became the Tamer Cats. So I can continue my career with them. I won a premiership with them in 93. Uh, we lost in 92 to Uni Mowbray. 94, I went to Hillwood and played with them for 10 years and won a premiership with them in 99 and 2000. I then returned back to the Tamer Cats in, or sorry, played with Campbelltown in 2001 and played in their back-to-back year in 2001 and then went back to Hillwood. And then 2003, I went back to the Tamer Cats and played in their second premiership. So there's only myself and one other guy, Jason Hines, that have played of the team of cats. And you had a bit of ability back then. I remember, as I said, I used to go and source all the scores in the area in Tasmania and uh, your name would come up. I think one of the days in now, how goes my memory here, 2001, you kicked a lot of goals at Campbelltown and there was multiple goals kicked by yourself in that year. And I'll show how many goals you kicked, but he kicked a few goals in that year. So, well done on your footy career. Thank you. We'll go to the uh, the accident, or we'll call it an accident. Now, I've got some information here that at 9.26pm on April 20. 25th, 2006, you happen to be working as a miner at Beaconsfield Mine. What time did you start that shift and did you think it was any, the day was any different than any other day? Oh, look, it was their last night shift, four or five day break. So I went off to work as normal, or what we thought was normal. So I went off down to the 925 level where myself and Brant and uh, Larry Knight was working. It's like any job, you, you know, you go in and do every day. You get a little bit complacent. And obviously we went into that area that night complacent because the, the ground was dead silence. And, you know, obviously it was a calm before the storm. Fortunately, you know, I'd been working in that area the night before where the ground was very responsive and very talkative towards us, where I was actually hit the night before by a rock probably the size of a football. But, you know, as normal, we just went about our normal business. You know, Cheesy gave us our jobs to do for that night, and my job was to take an underground loader and spiral some eight, nine kilometres to be 925 metres below the surface. You know, I was commenced backfilling uh, just as we would normal shift. The ground was very quiet. Brent and Larry arrived at around about 7.25 p.m., we started building the retaining wall. And as I said, people will get complacent. And we did get complacent. I'd been working in that area the night before and the ground was very responsive, very noisy. But that night we went in on the Anzac day. The ground was very quiet. You know, we put it down and had it calm before the storm. Were you always destined to be a miner? Was that something you always wanted to do? Or- no, I, uh, I got into mining... As a greenhorn, I had no previous mining experience. I started off as a nipper and worked my way through the chain from a nipper to a truck driver to a bogger operator, charge up, uh, even having a stint on a jumbo. But, you know, I was only in the mining mining game for about seven, seven and a half years. The lead up to the accident or the, the blast or the, the cave-in, do you remember vividly how, what happened at that point when you become trapped? What was the moments before that? Oh, basically we were building a retaining wall and we were using steel cables and we threaded it from one side of the drive, approximately five and a half metres wide by five and a half metres high. We used to come along and tension it up through eye bolts. We then took mesh, or we asked to mesh, but we took a, you know, probably a five or ten minute break, and then about 9.25pm there was a seismic event which obviously rocked the small country town. It registered something like 4.1 or 4.2 on the Richter scale. 
and caused a massive rock fall, you know, somewhere in the vicinity of, you know, maybe three or 4,000 tonne of rock. But the, basically, we, we had no prior warning. It was just quicker than you can blink and it was all over and done with. How big was the cage and how much rock was in the cage? Because there's, there's stories about you uh, when uh, that the cage was half full of rock and you had to cut your clothes off, and tell me if I'm wrong here, get, cut your clothes off to free your legs from the rock that was around you? No, basically the, the cage is about 1.4 metres square, approximately 900 high. At the time of the rock fall, there was a considerable amount of rock, somewhere probably half a tonne of rock, which covered my entire body. The only part of my body that I could move was my forearms and my head. Virtually from my chest down was completely covered. My left leg had been put in a position it should never have been put in. It was completely numb from the waist down, uh, which took some six days to recover. I didn't find out until some time later when I went to the hospital that I'd severely damaged my sciatic nerve. That was the reason why I lost the full sensation of that leg. But... After a period of time, you know, they talk about crush injury and they allow, you know, somewhere around the vicinity of four hours to remove the crush from your legs to stop toxins. We are in about the four and a half hour mark, which we decided to take that risk to try and get myself in a position where I was reasonably comfortable. But we took the rock and stacked it inside the cage and outside the cage to the little crevices that we could, uh, which then obviously reduced the amount of room we had inside the cage. So I think we had about seven or 800 mil wide by 1.4 wide. And, you know, you take two guys, one my size, one brand, who are reasonably large sort of a guys at the time of the accident. And, you know, we had one laying on his side, one laying on his back, you know, vice versa. But, you know, each time we turned left or right to swap our sides, it was like laying on a bit of better razor blades. We were being cut to pieces and, you know, we had to manage our wounds and stuff as well. So, How many days was it before you actually got contact with the outside world? And how did you stay, because I'm, I'm writing the psychology, right? How did you stay sane? You knew you were alive, buried under rock. So how did you keep yourself mentally sane in a, in a period of time which might have seemed like eternity. And how did you know that how many days had gone by? Yeah, well, basically, um, it was six days before we made any communication to the outside world. Unfortunately for both Brant and I, we, we, well, we knew, well, fortunately for us, we knew that we were alive, but unfortunately the guys from the outside didn't know that we were alive. We could hear everything that was going on inside the mine. Um, we could hear machines working and making their way closer to us. And to try and keep yourself sane and, and how we got through it, more so we, for me, it was more so I took on board and thought about family, you know, the kids and stuff like that, and used them as an inspiration to fight on. But there was so much happening throughout the course of the first six days. And obviously two days into the rescue, they found the body of our good friend, Larry, who unfortunately passed away in the incident. And, you know, we could feel the machines and even to the extent where we'd hear machines operating then dead silence. And we couldn't understand why there was dead silence because there was so much activity happening throughout the course of the days and nights. And it wasn't until after the silence that they started blasting, started drilling and blasting some three and a half, four metres from where, sorry, 15 metres from where we were to get to within three and a half, four metres of us. So it was very scary. And then obviously I took a pen and started writing times and dates on my overalls. So that what they did on the outside killed either both Brent and myself. There was evidence that we were alive at that particular time. Yeah, I laid there and wrote goodbye letters to every individual of the family. You know, and that's that's one of the hardest things I've had to do in my life. Did you know how many days had gone past before until I, you know, eventually got to you? Well, to be honest with you, we never really took into account how many days. We never kept count. But the thing is, I had a watch on and we knew that the accident happened around 9.25 p.m. Rather than go by 12 to 12 day or night, I actually went from 9.25. So each time it reached 9.25, I knew that it was day shift. I knew when it was night shift. You know, even though the rescue crews were starting like at 6 a.m. in the morning till 6 at night, we actually went off my watch at 9.25 so we then calculated day or night so we knew whether it was day shift or whether it was night shift. What about, because I'm obviously things are going through my head about the normal person and how a normal person reacts day to day. So food, water, malnutrition, dehydration, how did that, how did that go during the period? Well, for the first six days we had no food, we had no water apart from a small amount of groundwater. We took a helmet and collected a small amount of groundwater somewhere in the vicinity of you know, an hour and a half to two hours to get a mouthful of water. We also collected urine, so we had fluids if we needed to. But as they drilled and blasted their way closer to us, the fractures in the ground actually started to open up. And we were starting to get a lot more water coming in to the extent towards the day six where we were found alive that we were then suffering hypothermia because we're laying in a 29 degree heat. We've got flow through air and we've now got water. So we also had to cuddle each other for hours upon 
on end to transfer our body heat from one to another to stop ourselves from hypothermia, but also using them fluids. Being mindful that the groundwater that we're drinking was very heavily mineralised, so we had to be very careful on how much of that we consumed at any one time in case it made us very ill. That's amazing. How much, um, I'm curious, because I went a few years ago, I, uh, I'm a bit, I'm a large gentleman, not not too large, but I'm a large gentleman, I'm a bit solid like you are, Todd. How much weight did you lose in the period of time you were down there? Uh, I lost 11 kilo in 14 days. Fairly to say it was more muscle wastage than, than actual fat wastage. When they eventually got to you, were you saying to yourself, if I can get through a disaster like a, a mine collapse, then I can get through anything because mental resilience, strength of character, that would have all come into play because you would have thought, or was it that you as, as each day went on, you thought, we're going to get rescued here because we've lasted so many days and we're still alive with air. So I suppose, did that go through your mind? Yeah, one of the things, like, I was never confident of coming home until the day I stepped out of that cage. The thing is, I only needed the slightest little mistake to go wrong, and that 4,000 tonne of rock that was above us was going to come in. You know, like, it wasn't one big solid rock. It was a, it was a massive, crushed, broken rock, which was held together like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle, and that was then bulging down towards us. So we only needed one of that, you know, piece of rock to move. And there was a fair chance. So I wasn't confident of going home until the day I come out. Until the moment I come out. But the thing is, when we were rescued and it was time to come out, there was a decision made that it was either Brant going to come out first or myself was going to come out first. And Brant was brought out first. And the remainder five, six, seven minutes that I spent alone inside the basket after he'd gone was probably the longest and the hardest out of the entire 321 hours that we've been stuck underground previous. You know, he's just now gone out. He's gone to freedom. He's going home to his family. If it turns pear shaped now, I don't get to go home. And that was probably the one of the one of the hardest things I dealt with throughout the course of the rescue. What was the, the escape hatch or the the circumference of the hole or square that you went out? Like, how big did they make? I mean, I know they had the pipe going down, which was giving you food and, and water and other things. 90 mil, I think they the said. Link, yeah, the link line that we had, which was communication, cameras, and everything that we got by a food, clothing, medication, letters, whatever, was in a 100 mil PVC pipe, and they had electrical conduit joined together with a uh, like a 600 mil Mount Franklin water bottle on the end, and that was fed backwards and forwards up the tube, giving us our medication foods, clothing, whatever we needed. But the actual tunnel underneath that they bored through to us started off at about 300 mil in diameter and then it was uh, extended out to one metre. They then pushed that through. They wanted to be one metre below us and pushed two metres past us into the solid rock. But when they finished drilling and they went in to start breaking the rock away with jackhammers, the rock was too hard. Around 300 MPA was the rock. A normal house slab that you build a house on is only 20. So they then had to use explosives to, to drill and blast the remaining uh, area before they got to us. And unbeknownst to both Brent and myself, throughout the course of the rescue, 300 metres directly above us at 6.30 level, they had a team of explosives experts doing all different types of blasting, using all different types of explosives, uh, monitoring the vibrations and taking all that information back to the to the control room so they had it all in, in writing so they had to do that in the final stages they could then come to us explain to us what they wanted to do so, and that's what they did in the end is brought a guy in who explained to us what he wanted to do and he went about his business drilling and blasting using a, a PCF exposures which is low impact and started to, to drill and blast his way towards where we were but Unbeknownst to both Brent and myself, they were supposed to be one metre below us and then we were pushed two metres past us. But in the final stages of the blasting, we could hear the rock shattering in the tunnel. And when they sent the guys back in to drill up that metre to where we were, they were so precise with their surveying, drilling and blasting that when they broke through, there was only 300 mil below us. That's why we could hear the rock shattering in the tunnel. What sort of condition were you in when you come out? I mean, obviously you've been there for a period of time. And how long are you in there? How many days? 14 days. What sort of condition were you in physically and mentally after 14 Days. Well, physically, uh, the paramedics were amazed how how both Brant and I come out of it. Um, as you've seen, when we come back to the surface, there was a lot of arguments and discussion between ourselves and paramedics where, you know, they weren't going to allow us to walk out where we were adamant we were going to walk out. The simple fact is we walked into that mine on the Anzac Day 2006, so when the 9th of May come, 14 days later, both Brant and I were adamant we were going to walk out. You know, there was there was talk that they were going to sedate us uh, and bring us out in wheelchairs, but unbeknownst to a lot of people, the, the wheelchair thing is correct. Both Brant and I were placed in wheelchairs at three. Seven, five, and just 30 or 40 metres below the surface. The cage all but come to a stop. Both Brant and I got out of the wheelchairs and folded them up and stuck around the corner so nobody could see them. And when the cage reached the surface,
us at 5.59am on the 9th of May and we walked out there unassisted. We walked out of there on just pure adrenaline only, really. How far down were you? How many how many kilometres down were you? Uh, we weren't quite a kilometre. We're at 925 metres. That's amazing. After the accident, you've walked out and, you know, you've been there 14 days and locked in a mine a mine shaft. You, one of, you lost one of your colleagues and uh, you walked out with a guy you were working with. The Afterwards, the effect on you as a person. How do you look at life today, Todd? Well, life's a, um, a completely different journey for me now. I um, Prior to my accident, I was a very selfish man and I've done things in life that I like to do and my family comes second best, you know. And when you're put into a position like I was where there's a chance you're going to lose, you know, a lot of things and probably the most important things in your life it makes you realize what is important and my kids are the most important thing in my life you know i've struggled over the years and even now 15 years on i'm still at stages where i have really good days and really bad days and i've been in some dark places of, of late and not more so than just recently when i lost my dad three years ago and you know losing my dad was probably the final straw that broke the camel's back and i tried to deal with a lot of the psychological side of it myself but basically myself was the only one that couldn't see the spiral effect it was having on me and what direction it was heading and i got a real reality check very early in the, in the piece when you know Carolyn and the kids were packed with their bags and sitting out the house waiting for me to come home ready to leave because of the person I became and you know I've said this many a times on social media you know I became a monster the person I was through the, the PTSD and the stresses and you lose your identity even today people still recognize who you are at times and the thing is there's days you want to talk about it and there's days you don't want to talk about it and, and people feel as though they're a part of it because they endured it and spent so much it was so much on TV it was for 14 days of constant you know, footage across you know, northern Tasmania, Beaconsfield. So people feel a part of it and they feel so they know you. But deep down, there's a lot of people that doesn't realise how much it affects you still now, even talking about it today. Is that the emotional part of it or the trauma and obviously being stuck in a place, in a cage, right beneath the ground, just the, the fallout from the memories of that? Is that where the, the emotion comes from or is that what you're talking about when you say that? Not really. It's, it's, it's more so like we lost a good friend too. We've got to yeah. realise that. It would have been a much more better situation scenario for all, all three had come home and I remember leaving the hospital after coming out and making my way just down the road two or three kilometres to where you know I was fortunate enough that Larry's widow Jackie had held off on Larry's funeral so that you know, we could attend and I still remember attending that service and walking into the church and sitting down at the, the church pew and just looking across to my right and directly across to my right was Jackie and the two boys and the thing is that the youngest one was six months old and he's not even going to grow up not knowing what his father was like and you know Larry was an absolute champion guy and I just hope that one day I can have an opportunity to sit down with the boys and just you know tell them exactly what a champion Blake Larry was that's the sort of thing that I struggle with as well as I said I'm a team sports person and team sport you know togetherness uh, spirit I'm sure that the mining team would have had uh, you know you're risking your life basically going on the ground because you know that the risk I mean it's just like any other I was a, I was a sparky by trade so I know the pitfalls of being an electrician because it can kill you you as a miner back then having to do that there'd be a lot of closeness in the miners as a group yeah that's exactly right and um, you know I remember sitting down with my father you know, only weeks literally weeks before the uh, the mine, mine accident and I feared for my safety but it's a typical male thing in any male it's not going to happen to me but um, unfortunately it did and I still remember sitting down having that conversation with my father in his little tin shed out the back of his home and you know I just said to him if anything happens to me you make sure my family and that are looked after and unfortunately it did happen but fortunately you know I got to I got to come home un unlike some. Were you amazed I mean I follow the story pretty closely because I love Tasmania and I think I'm adopted Tasmanian wig I'll tell you that but the thing is um is that uh, you're surprised by how much coverage you got around because it went worldwide didn't it? It did and uh, you know it, it's going to sound funny and you're probably laughing at this but I remember lying there in the darkness and I, I made the comment to Brent do you reckon we made the local newspaper which is the examiner not knowing that it was going to go as worldwide as what it did and have the media coverage like the thing is that majority of the media were in Tasmania because of the anniversary of Port Arthur the media contingency was already there um, so they, they converged on Beaconsfield and the car park at the local museum that became a Winnebago city um, where all the media set up and they had their press conferences and everything every day so even to have it go you know as far 
far as America and, and places like that, you know. And the thing is, the day that we found that I've, both Brant and I were singing The Gambler just to pass time and just to have that, in, you know, just that information was put out on national TV. And, you know, I still remember the day that I received a letter in the mail on a gold letterhead from Kenny Rogers, a handwritten letter, you know, from him. I hope one day we had the opportunity to meet, which, you know, thankfully we did. That's great. And out of adversity comes positive things. And I suppose tonight we're doing this interview on a Friday night, right? And your football team, the Brisbane Lions, I believe, playing now. Have you got footy, you got footy there close by somewhere? I haven't got it on, mate, because I'm one of these guys that doesn't like watching my own team play because I get a little bit nervous. But last time I looked, I think they were about 10 points up. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I think it was pretty close, but I'm doing the interview, so I, I don't know. But TV's in the other room. So I suppose I'll finish off by saying, I'll, I'll follow your story pretty closely. And Wigo, as I said, has been giving me updates of how you're going. How are you feeling today in 2021, you as a person right now? Yeah, look, it's been a challenge. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and deny it. It's been a challenge. I've gone through some adversity throughout the year. Years and, and I've some struggles and some pain and none more so, you know, losing my dad. He was my best mate and losing him was just like the end of the world. But, you know, I'm thankful. I can climb out of bed in the morning. I can walk outside. I can look at the sky and think I've seen another day where, you know, 15 years ago, there was a chance that I, I probably wouldn't have done that. And, um, you know, I've managed to see my children grow. You know, next month, my youngest one turns 21. Back in the day, he was only six. From the footage back then, when he was in my arms as a six-year-old, I wouldn't even I wouldn't even be able to lift him off the ground now. He's that bigger boy. But, you know, I have my good days and I have my bad. I try and keep myself as occupied as I can, just doing little things, helping a mate out down the road with a bit of framing and stuff like that, just to keep me occupied. But there's days where I can take on Mike Tyson and there's just days I just can't be bothered getting out of bed. But, you know, I try and put one foot in front of the other and just look at the sky and think, I'm still here. Let's keep going. The last one. Uh, the Shippies OHA they're uh, they're going okay and I see you still follow local football and you get along and have a look yeah look I'd probably not say much this year I haven't got along as much I'm actually going to uh, a game at OHA tomorrow against Hutchins I think they're playing as I mentioned earlier Daryl White was down we went out for tea tonight I think he's having a run around in the uh, Magoos tomorrow I'm going to go and do a uh, motivational talk in the morning here in Hobart. So I'll do that. Then I'll shoot off across to Gilston Bay and watch Whitey play and catch up with him and Acker after and go to their night tomorrow night and hopefully have a good day. Todd Russell, you've been an absolute pleasure. Thanks very much for joining me on A1 TV, The Mark Show, episode 11. It's been great for a chat. Listen, hopefully I'll be down pretty shortly, pretty soon. So let's hope I can catch up, have a meal and, and have a chat. It'd be great to meet you in person. No worries, Danny. Make sure we go organise that and we'll do that for sure. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Danny. Cheers, mate.